I'm going to give you a kind of an overview of Jewish history and the Jewish history in relation to the notion of globalism. Judaism is a global religion, like Christianity and Islam are global religions. But there's a basic and significant difference between Judaism and the other two. And that is that whereas Christianity was a religion of an empire, and therefore was able to expand globally through empire, through power, persuasion, economic force, what have you, so did Islam through an empire, power, persuasion, economic force. Judaism never had an empire. Uh, Judaism's global situation was a situation that was, in essence, one can say, I guess you could say, forced on the Jewish people. But Jews ended up being a global community spread through the notion or through the phenomenon of exile and dispersion. You know the term uh, diaspora? You know what that means? What is diaspora? I'm going to do this a little bit like a, like a course. So you're going to have to just put up with me. I may ask you some questions. You may have to respond. We're going to sit there for a long time, and everybody's going to be uncomfortable. What is diaspora? What does it mean? Some people already raised their hands. Yes? Isn't that when um, is you're like spread out? Yeah, it's like a community spread out. Uh, up until maybe 30, 40 years ago, Jews had a monopoly on diaspora. But now, and let's talk about that, because it's really interesting. Now a lot of people have diaspora. What did diaspora mean? Diaspora means something like this. There is a center, there is a homeland. There is a center that is the cultural, religious, spiritual, economic, intellectual center. Maybe some of them, maybe not all of those adjectives. But there's a center. And a community in the center is the community that's kind of in control of its own destiny. It runs its own operation and its own affairs. And then there's the community outside the center that's out in the outlying areas. Now, in the ancient world, there were no centers and diasporas. In the ancient world, there were separate communities that lived in their areas. And if they moved to another area, which was very unlikely because there wasn't a lot of movement at the time, then they would simply assimilate into the cultures of the other areas. If they were large enough, if there was a major migration that was caused by famine or by conquest, some other community comes in and takes over and people flee en masse, then you might have a migration, and that migration might move that community to a new location, and they would set up shop. But there wasn't this, a notion of diaspora, where there's a center community, and then there are outlying satellite communities that are sort of looking toward the center. That seems to have begun with the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem in the year 586 BCE. I said BCE. Why did I say BCE? What is BCE? I'm just listening to myself. I'm not making any sense. What's, what's the difference between BC and BCE? Yes? BCE means before common era, and BC suggests Christianity. Well, it means, it says before, it's before Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so let's talk for a moment about calendar. I'm going to go off on a few tangents, but it's all relevant. There's no tangent that's tangential <laughs> in this talk. Calendars are always reflective of power, always. When a new community emerges and is in contention with an established community, oftentimes they argue over calendar. When is Christmas? Come on, give me the obvious answer. Wrong. Only in the West is it December 25th. It's January 6th, if you happen to be an Eastern Christian community. There's contention, political contention, and contention over authority between these different communities. That contention is often reflected in calendar. When we say B.C. and A.D., we are making a statement about Christian dominance. And I'm here at a Christian university, too, so I can, I can say that. The Muslims don't use B.C.E., C.E., A.D., B.C. They use A.H. What is A.H.? After Hijra. Hijra is the year in which Muhammad moved from Mecca to Medina and established a community that was the beginning of the successful community of Islam. <coughs> Muslims run according to that calendar, not according to B.C. A.D. calendar. The reason that we assume that everybody in the world runs according to our calendar is because we run according to that calendar. And because the Western world, the Western Christian world, has been dominant for the last numbers of centuries, the Christian 
calendar has become the universal calendar of business and diplomacy in the world today. But in other parts of the world, it doesn't. If you read the Bible, and you read a section from the Old Testament, which we call the Hebrew Bible, you'll see that something occurred in the third year of the reign of so-and-so, because that was the power in that particular period of time, and so they judged calendar according to the beginning of the rule of the king. The rule of the king in the Christian world is the rule of Christ, so it begins with the year zero. But if you want to be neutral about it and not be theologically imposing your position on the rest of the world, you say BCE and CE, common era. It's the common era of reckoning, and that's why we use that. Where was I? 586 BCE, the, the first temple that was in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. Previous to that, and by the way, that was a temple that was servicing only two-tenths, one-fifth, of the ancient Israelite community. Two tribes of Israelites survived the destruction of the northern kingdom of the Israelites that occurred 150 years earlier by the Assyrian Empire. And when the Assyrians conquered, they did what, what empires do, which is try to prevent the areas they conquer from rising up and rebelling against them. The, the policy of the Assyrian Empire was to remove all of the academic, the administrative, and the ruling classes of all the areas that they conquered and bring them to another area. So if they conquered country X, they would remove the intellectual administrative uh, classes from country X and make them be the administrative classes for country Y. Country Y well, they didn't have any more administrative classes because they were forcibly removed and brought to country Z. And when you have the mix of the classes, you can't get the people to gang up together and rebel against the government because they're fighting each other too much. All the government really wants is to have people pay taxes. So, and that could be done because you could run the economy, basically, but you didn't have the kind of solidarity that would be necessary to, to have a, a rebellion against the empire. So the ten tribes of Israel that were living in the northern part of the ancient Israelite area were conquered by the Assyrians. The two tribes living in the south were not conquered by the Assyrians. Those ten tribes were mixed among other peoples and they got lost. Does that word ring a bell? That's the origin of the so-called lost ten tribes of Israel. They didn't take a wrong turn and get lost somewhere. They were lost by intermingling and mixing and assimilating and losing their sense of identity. 150 years later, the Assyrian Empire collapsed by that time, the Babylonian Empire was the great empire, and the Babylonians succeeded in conquering the last two tribes. Two tribes survived the Assyrian conquest, they didn't survive the Babylonian conquest. And at that period of time, a very large community of Jews was brought to Babylon uh, on the Tigris-Euphrates River, not far from Baghdad today. And that was the beginning of the Jewish diaspora. Jews were there in a, in a large community. They didn't do exactly the same kind of intermixing of communities. Instead of mixing them all around in the, within the empire, they brought the elites to Babylon and they created a magnificent international global city in Babylon made up of the elites of all the various peoples they conquered. And there was a community of Jews who went to Babylon and survived there as a community. And there's a big question as to why the Jews survived the Babylonian conquest, but the Israelites did not survive the Assyrian conquest. In any event, that was really the beginning of the Jewish diaspora. That seems to be the first real diaspora. There were people outside of the land of Israel who wanted to come back to the land of Israel. That's what we called it, the land of Israel in the ancient days. Um, not Palestine, but the land of Israel. And they wanted to come back, but they couldn't come back. And uh, Eventually, the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, and 70 years later, the Judeans, the Jews, were invited to come back to the land and reestablish the temple and be there, and it was a wonderful, wonderful change, and Cyrus was considered in the Bible to be a, 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 um, a tool of God. It was, he was a great and wonderful person because Cyrus, the king of Persia, invited the Jews to come back to the land of Israel and reestablish their hegemony there. And how many Jews came back? Uh, very few. Most Jews had a pretty good 
life in Babylonia. And they thought, well, we'll stick around. And in the, bis in the meantime, in those 70 years, they set up businesses, they owned land, they were, some of them were farmers, they were working in the administration, they spoke new languages, they had assimilated into the local cultures, but they didn't lose their Jewish identity, their Judean identity. And that was the beginning of diaspora. Not only did they remain in Babylon, but some went to other places all around. There was a, 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 a big group of Jews who lived up the Nile toward Nubia on an island called Elephantine. Has anybody been to Egypt in your travels? Anybody been to Egypt? Go to Aswan? Okay, well, there's a, there was a community living there, and we have actually, within the last 50 or 60 years, have discovered manuscripts in Jewish languages there that describe how the Jews lived and their, their contracts and wedding documents and all kinds of interesting things from that island. So there, there was, that's diaspora. Now, the first diaspora seems to have been the Jewish diaspora. At least that's what we, we, we know about. Most, most people who are spread out like that lose their identity, their unique identity, and they assimilate and become, they integrate to the, into the local populations. Today we have an Armenian diaspora, huge numbers, thousands and thousands of Armenians living away from Armenia, looking back to Armenia as the homeland. Not necessarily wanting to go there, but living there. We have a huge Korean diaspora, we have, and people call it the Korean diaspora. How many thousands, how many tens of thousands of Koreans live in Los Angeles, in my neighborhood, in Koreatown? Lots, right? And there, there is a sense of associating with Korea, which is the homeland. And yet, they don't necessarily want to move back to Korea. But there might be a lot of back and forth movement as well. So diaspora means there are people living in the other areas, but they kind of look toward the center. The Jews have been in diaspora for about close to 3,000 years, a global community. <coughs> a little bit different than the reason for Christian spread. Jewish spread was really moving. And, and another difference is that while a second temple was built in the land of Israel, and the population of Jews in the land of Israel grew and expanded greatly under the Greeks and the Romans, they always remained Essentially, even when they were officially independent, they remained extremely dependent upon other communities until finally the second temple was destroyed. By whom? Just for you who do early Christianity, you should know this. If you did study it, if you didn't, you should be embarrassed. Because whatever I study is, of course, the most important and interesting topic. So I assume everyone else should feel the same way about it. Yes. No, you spoke last time. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay, yeah, you get extra credit. Nero? Sorry? Nero? No, not Nero, but his community of people, that's good enough. The, as you said, the Romans. So the Romans destroyed the second temple in Jerusalem in the year 70 CE of the Common Era. And shortly after that, 70 years after that, and by the way, I just want to make it very clear, the reason that the, the Romans destroyed the temple was not because they were vindictive and nasty. They destroyed the temple because the Jews rebelled against the Roman Empire, tried to kick them out, and they were making a very powerful statement. They destroyed the temple and prevented Jews from engaging in religious practice of worshipping the God of Israel, the only monotheist God that was in existence. It seems sort of like a funny statement. The only monotheist God. Why would there be another monotheist God if there's only one God? <laughs> but it was the only community that was worshipping that one God until the emergence of Christianity, which happened around this time. Uh, and the Jews of Palestine, Israel, land of Israel, rebelled against the Roman Empire a second time, 70 years later, with a rebellion called the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. And with that, the Romans forbade the Jews from even living in the area of Jerusalem. A Jew who was seen within eyeshot of the city of Jerusalem could be killed on the spot by a Roman legionnaire. Not because the Romans were nasty and vindictive, unless you happen to be Jewish. Then you think it's because the Romans were nasty and vindictive, because you have a very Jewish perspective, a very narrow perspective. But from a historian's perspective, they, they needed to prove once and for all that you cannot rebel against the Roman Empire and so they completely, they tried to wipe out Jewish identity entirely. 
No Jews were allowed to live in Judea, the land of the Jews. The, the name was changed from Judea to Palestina, Syria, Palestina, uh, for, the Pal for, the, for the Philistines that used to live there but were no longer a, a, a recognizable community. And then the Jews, that was when the real diaspora really developed. And by the time of, the, say, the first and second century, Jews were living basically throughout the Mediterranean, and they were living in what we would call Iraq today, Iran, Afghanistan, maybe as far east as Pakistan, and certainly all the way to Spain and Morocco in the Mediterranean. So that's a global community. They weren't in touch with one another necessarily. But by that period of time, they had developed a kind of religious um, uh, community that was different than the biblical community. Imagine, imagine for a moment that the proper way to worship God was through offerings and sacrifice, and you were prevented from doing that. You couldn't do that anymore. Offerings and sacrifice were only allowed in the temple in Jerusalem. That was the, that was the sacred spot and Jews were no longer allowed to practice their religion. There was no more temple. So Judaism developed and changed. And Judaism changed away from the old biblical religion at the same time that another monotheistic tradition began emerging into history, exactly the same time. That second monotheistic tradition that was emerging into history is called, today, Christianity in all of its various forms. So Judaism, every, every form of Judaism that is practiced today, anywhere in the world, is as different from biblical religion as Christianity is different from biblical religion. So it's really quite different. Prayers are held in synagogues, not in temples. Sometimes uh, Jews will call it a temple in, to be reminiscent of the synagogue, of the great temple in Jerusalem, but they're not temples. They're synagogues, they're places of worship. And Judaism morphed into a religious tradition that has a different theology, different practice, different ideas that are substantially different from that of uh, the biblical world. So um, Judaism and Christianity and Islam are global communities, but they are different in their global, global uh, notion. I want to now move us a little bit forward in history and to look at, at the um, engagement in, of Jews in international business, in international relations. You've heard about this, right? Jews are involved in international business. Part of that is uh, part of a, a kind of a, uh, a mythic view of Jews and Judaism, but it is based on a certain historical uh, tradition as well. Um, when, when Judaism made that morph from biblical religion to what we call today rabbinic Judaism. That's the kind of Judaism that's practiced today. If you're orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, ultra-orthodox, Haredi, uh, whatever the, the term is that's used for Jewish practice today, it's all called rabbinic Judaism. It's all based on a kind of Jewish assumptions that are different than they were in the biblical period. And there's one aspect of that change which is really necessary to think about for a moment. When the Israelites and the Jews were living in the ancient world and offering sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem, they were an agricultural community. People lived in the, on the land, in villages. There were essentially no real cities aside from Jerusalem. A few towns, but not what we would call cities. And it was an agricultural economy and an agricultural society. When they were forced out of the land and they went into diaspora, they really had a difficult time remaining peasants, remaining in agriculture. Partly because they didn't have land, they were removed from land, and they needed to make a living, and so they got involved in other kinds of activities. That's one reason. There's another reason that's also extremely important. And, and that is one of the fundamental, apps, fundamental aspects of Judaism, which some people don't know about, but has a very important uh, impact on the way Jews practice and function today. Now, how am I, how am I going to say this? When, when Christianity emerged into history, Christianity, and I'm, I'm speaking now as an academic, 
when Christianity emerged into history, it, its authority, the authority for a new religious tradition was a new revelation, a new testimony of God's will that was given through the person of God as, um, 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 why am I blanking out on the term? Um, God who came in human form, incarnate, the divinity incarnate through Jesus, Jesus as Christ Messiah. What Jesus said and did was recorded and became sacred scripture because Jesus was the Word. Jesus was the Word of God. So when Christianity emerged into history, it saw the old scripture of the Jews as being a kind of prophecy for the coming of Jesus and the truth and the realization of the prophecies of the old scripture through the personhood of God who is incarnate in Jesus. Is that making sense? Okay. So that's a new scripture. Judaism didn't have a new scripture, right? Judaism just had the Old Testament, which Jews don't call the Old Testament, because as soon as you say the Old Testament, then you mean that it's old and kind of not really in date, it's sort of outdated. It makes more sense when it's realized through the fulfillment of the New Testament. Jews didn't believe that, so they put all of their cards in the Hebrew Bible, which is essentially the same text as the Old Testament. The order of the books are somewhat different, but the same, it's the same books of the Bible. But at the same time, Judaism was changing radically. And Judaism also has something which is essentially a new scripture. And it's called in Jewish parlance the oral scripture, as opposed to the written scripture. Has anybody heard that Jews had more than one scripture? Probably not, for those of you who might be into this stuff. That is the Talmud. How many people have heard the term Talmud? Raise your hand. Really, raise your hand so I get a sense. Okay, so a good number of people have heard the word Talmud. The Talmud is a, is a literature that emerged among Jews in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries and eventually became canonized as an official text. And it is a very strange kind of scripture. What it is, it, first of all, it's encyclopedic. It's huge. It's much larger than the Old Testament or the New Testament. It's a very large text, and it's a record of the discussions and arguments of Jewish scholars for about 500 years. That's what it is. And the topics of those discussions come from the Old Testament, from material of the Old Testament. It could be stories, it could be laws, it could be customs, it could be associations, it could be theology, that are then expanded and discussed in a major text which looks like, if you were to read it, it's like a record of C-SPAN. Sounds pretty boring, doesn't it? How many people have listened to C-SPAN? It's really boring. This isn't Santa Monica City Council on C-SPAN. Every once in a while on the, on the radio, you get it on KPCC or KCRW. What it is is just arguments of rabbis discussion about issues. And something is very interesting about that text. Uh, this is the text that when you see uh, Jews studying in yeshivas and in traditional formats, what they're doing is they're studying this text in great detail. This is a text that is a record about argument, about arguments, about discussions, about issues. What did God mean by this? What did God mean by this? You know, all the various topics that one could imagine coming out of the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible, was discussed or were discussed in the Talmud. And the Talmud has no conclusion about what the answer to the question is. And this is very odd. This is a way of doing business which is not the way we do business in America or in the West today. Now I'm going to move on to what's going to sound like a tangent but is not. When we do business at the university today, we work according to syllogistic principles of thought. We take an idea and we run it through the sequence and we try to arrive at a conclusion. Our goal is to arrive at a conclusion. Our goal is to find the answer. When you take an exam, somebody wants you to tell them what the answer is. You need to find out the answer either through math, through chemistry, through doing an experiment, through logic, through development. 
The Talmud does not work that way. The Talmud is an associative document. It's a document that doesn't run through syllogistic thinking. And, therefore, there are no final conclusions. Rather, what it is, is a continuous re-examination of the topic from a new angle. It's associative. It is taking an item, an issue, to be examined and looking at it from every possible imaginal, imaginary or imagined direction in order to try to understand the meaning of the topic. And it requires a lot of thought and a lot of flexibility in thinking. You couldn't do that. Oh, 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 by the way, and that was a job that everybody was supposed to be involved in. That became part of Jewish prayer. When you're in, required to pray daily in the Jewish tradition, prayer is one way to observe the responsibility of prayer. But another way to observe the responsibility of prayer is to study, is to learn. Learn through this kind of associative style of learning. So learning and, and, and examination and critical thinking about things in new and creative ways became a natural cultural aspect of what it meant to be Jewish. Imagine, and, and status, if you were smart, you got the girl. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sounding very sexist. But imagine, the Jewish community is now spread out throughout the world. There are no armies. You can't run for office. You can't drive your car fast down the street. You can't play sports and, and be a star. You can't be a jock. I'm talking about men. This is a male society in the pre-modern period. And how are you going to show that you are a high-status person? By being able to engage in that process of thinking about things, about engagement in a topic, thinking about new ways to figure out an answer to a question. But remember, there is no final answer because there's always a new way of possibly of thinking about something. And so in order to gain status in the Jewish community, there was no hierarchy. You couldn't become a parish priest and then eventually a bishop, a cardinal, and the pope. It was impossible. There's no hierarchy. A rabbi is a rabbi because he is a scholar. Now there is a rabbi can be a rabbi because she is a scholar. But in the pre-modern period, one couldn't do that. And a scholar, no one, you don't take a test, you just prove that you're smart and that you can do the work. And that became a very important value within Judaism. Farmers had a difficult time studying because they had to be working in the fields all day. And so farming and being a serf or a peasant sort of fell out of the possibilities of Jewish life because it was, it was just very difficult to do. And so Judaism began to move, not only religiously, but it also moved economically and in terms of social status to become a kind of a, what we would call today, kind of a middle class um, society where everybody was learned, everybody was literate in a world where almost nobody was literate. And everybody was into study and value, and study was of great value. So we have this community of people who are spread around the world and they're eking out a living somehow in very small communities. A community of Jews might be a community of 50 people or 80 people within a community of thousands of others. In some big places, there might be 500 or 1,000 or maybe 2,000. But in most places, they were small. Now, when Europe was in the Middle Ages, Europe existed in a world in which there were nobles, there was the church, and the political scene and the economic scene was organized around the manor house, where there would be a noble knight or a noble person, a nobleman or a noble family that owned land, peasants lived on the land, and they did agriculture. Every manor area or county had its own wine press, it had its own mill for milling flour, it had its own church, it had a couple of villages, and they were mostly engaged in agriculture and nobody knew how to read. The parish priest might know how to read, but not necessarily. In the urban areas, not the local parish priest, in the manor house, who was really a peasant who learned how to become a priest, the monasteries knew how to read and knew how to transfer information. But they were not necessarily very friendly with the nobles who were in competition. So the noble, the noble families needed to have someone to help them do administration. Many times the, noble, the nobles didn't know how to read themselves. I'll give you an example. Charlemagne, important guy, right? 
heavy-duty, important guy, the first Holy Roman Emperor, crowned by the Pope, in charge of a huge area of land in Central Europe. He, he sent a delegation to his counterpart in the Muslim world, a guy named Harun al-Rashid, who was the caliph in Baghdad. And he needed, uh, he, he sent his uh, gifts to the, to the caliph, and then the caliph would, of course, send gifts back to Charlemagne, and it was all very uh, interesting, and a, a very interesting diplomatic move. And there were Jews who, by the way, who were involved, involved in the delegation, partly because they knew languages. So Charlemagne had Jews who lived in the court or around, and they accompanied. We know about this. We even know the name of the Jew, of one of the Jews who actually survived the trip. Most of the people didn't survive because it took a year to get there and another year to get back, and there was disease and, and, and fighting. And in any event, when Charlemagne's group around, arrived in the caliph's, or the caliph's um, court in Baghdad, the caliph was surrounded by philosophers and thinkers and poets and um, uh, scientists and all. And uh, uh, Charlemagne knew how to sign his name, but arguably didn't know how to write. He had some people who could read for him, but he was not very well educated. It wasn't necessary in a Christian environment, and I don't mean it's, it's not because it's Christian, the European environment in those times. And so the noble families needed people to come and to run their affairs, to keep the books, to make sure that they paid their bills, to make sure that the tax, that the produce came in from tax from the, from the agricultural areas that they ran, and so they invited Jews in. And that's how the Jews really got into Northern Europe, because they were invited in by nobles. And the Jews lived there, and they did this kind of administrative work. And soon it became clear that the Jews had contacts with Jews in other parts of the world, because they were mobile. They didn't stay in one area. They, if they were invited somewhere and given a good <coughs> arrangement to live and protected by the nobles, they would go and take the job whereas everybody else was pretty much stationary. So the Jews knew languages, and they had contacts. So when the nobles wanted to trade goods from their little manor or their county to some other place in Europe or in the Far East, Europe, for example, had a lot of furs, a lot of animal hides, but it didn't have good metal. It didn't know how to work metal really well. Metal was really well worked in the Middle East. Uh, jewels were available from other places. So in order to get these goods, and the noble people wanted to have them, they needed to have them, armor, for example, and weapons in order to protect themselves, they need to trade. They couldn't move beyond their boundaries because, by definition, the noble families were in conflict with all the other noble families in Europe. And as you move further away from your own manor, you were less protected and you were less likely to survive. Jews, on the other hand, had no power whatsoever. They, nobody, everybody knew that a Jew could not pick up a sword and, and fight, and why would they do it anyway? Because there's, there are not enough Jews around to even create a, a manor house for themselves. So Jews ended up being kind of neutral characters who were able to move from manor to manor, from duchy to duchy, from county to county, from state to state, from land to land, from language to language, and trade among themselves for the people that they represented. And that was the beginning of Jewish globalism in this kind of modern sense of the economic term. And another thing that gave Jews advantage for international trade was that they could trust one another. They spoke the same language. They had an international language of Hebrew. They were part of the same culture, which was a kind of international Jewish culture. And because they all studied the same sacred texts, and in those books that make up the Talmud, there's a lot of discussion about fair trade practices, how to make a mortgage, uh, how to make payments in time, what one needs to do in order to trust the accommodating purchaser or the seller of the goods and the items, and everyone was working with the same legal system, whereas in Europe, if you went from what is today England to France to Germany to Poland to Hungary, these were all different systems running according to different values and different languages and with different assumptions about how to make, how to make deals and how to do international commerce. 
that the Jews were very successful and they were the only way for Europeans to really trade. And so Jews did a very, very great service to Europe as being the en enablers for international development and international relations in the medieval period. Another reason was because the church frowned upon um, making a living through trade. It wasn't considered an honest living. Honest living is working the land, producing something, and selling it. You make something, you earn for it. But if you buy an item for $3 and you sell it for $4, it's seen as unfair. That, that's the way the economy works. That's the way economies work. But it wasn't seen as fair by the church. And for good reason. Because you, in some places you don't have to work very hard. Today, you can, it's very dangerous. You can get off on all kinds of political tangents here about who's making the money today. The people who have the money are making the money. They're making money on the money, on their money, not through labor and, and work. They just, if you have a lot of money in the bank, you invest it to make money with your money. But if you don't have the money, you don't have a chance. So there's, there's a valid criticism for that kind of uh, deal. But economies don't function <laughs> without that kind of deal. And so eventually Jews got pushed out of the market because Christianity began to lift its culturally. It began to consider this not such a, such a problem. And so Christians got into international trade by the high Middle Ages and the end of the Middle Ages and at that point, they pushed Jews out. Jews were not able to compete because Christians had power and Jews didn't have power. Jews were then kind of pushed into the money lending business, which they were able to do because the church really frowned on money lending because that is sometimes called what? Usury. And usury is a bad thing because that's even a worse uh, possibility of making money with money. Unfortunately, economies need to have loans in order to build things like buildings and universities, and then you pay them back. So Jews got involved in that kind of business. That's the kind of globalization that the Jews got involved in. They got pushed out of trade, they got pushed into money, money lending, and that money lending actually became a source of tax farming by the nobles themselves. It's a little bit complicated, but I, I, I will, I'll give you an example of how it worked. A noble is not independent. A noble man, are we all together? Everybody take a deep breath, because if you're me, you're starting to fall asleep by this time. <sighs> a nobleman is not an independent agent. A nobleman is in a relationship with his noble. And that nobleman is in a relationship with his noble. A nobleman is a client and a boss at the same time. He has people under him, and he has people above him. A nobleman gets land because the king gives land to his most favored noble <coughs> friends who then own land, but owe the king soldiers if the king wants to go to war. This is the relationship of knights and uh, uh, um, uh, another word is slipping my mind, but it will come eventually. Uh, it, it will come, hopefully. And, uh, and then, so those big, strong, powerful nobles that have a lot of land would then divide their land, they have a lot of land, divide their land into smaller plots and give them to their friends, and their friends would then rule and govern those plots, and when their noble friend that gave them the land wanted soldiers to protect them, then those nobles had to give them their knights who were in a vassal relationship. That's the term. They were a vassal relationship with their lords. And so you have a king, a, a first circle of lords, another larger circle of lords, and then more circles of lords until you get to the lowest level uh, lords who are simply families who live in an area and have serfs and peasants and they can only supply one or two knights to their person that they're in vassalhood to. So, if you are a low-level lord and you need a loan because you need, you're having trouble with your crops, and you, or you need to buy equipment, or you want to put a, an addition on your house, you would get a loan from the lord who is above you. But you wouldn't get it directly from the lord, you would get it from the Jew who is hired as the administrator of the lord's estate. 
and the Jew would give him the money. And if he didn't pay back the money, the Jew was in charge of collecting that money too. So the Jew was the messenger, if you will. And so if the guy wasn't able to pay back the money, it was the Jew's responsibility to collect. If it didn't work, then the noble, who was really the protector of the Jew, could take the land back that was given to the knight. But he would always do it through the Jew. The Jew was always the person who was engaged in the transaction. You might ask, that was kind of stupid. Don't Jews know enough that they shouldn't be the middleman in this case? But since they really didn't really have a, other alternatives, way of to, to make a living, they were really involved in this. So the Jews became, in essence, what we would call tax farmers, where they were the ones who were doing the dirty work for the nobles and the lords in the communities um, to collect money for the people who owed money and who were requiring taxes. And so when there were economic issues and economic problems, uh, these issues were directed usually against the Jews, and the Jews had, had trouble. And they got eventually pushed out of money lending as well. Uh, that's, that's the short story of the kind of international scope of, of Jewish engagement, why Jews have been involved in trade, and why, um, and why Jews still are involved in trade and still are involved pretty highly in the professions and not so much in agriculture, and not so much in blue-collar work. Um, it's very interesting because uh, it's it's tempting to it's tempting to brag about this, but I'm I'm going to do it a little bit because I think it's interesting from particularly in a university perspective. This is Jewish culture. Jewish culture expects and requires a lot of learning in order to advance in social standing within the Jewish world. It's good to be smart. You can't do it by being a good football player. You can't do it by being a good soldier. You can only do it by being clever, being smart, figuring out new ways to think about things. And so when Jews began to move away from the traditional Jewish religious values of the old world, in America, for example, and began to so-called assimilate or to to become integrated into the larger society, Jewish culture, even though it wasn't religious anymore, still retained this notion of study, which is so important. And so Jews, you see Jews everywhere involved in learning at high levels. You see Jews involved in the, uh, what is uh, Yellen, um, Janet Yellen, what's her position? In the, what is it? There, there, a lot of Jews are involved in that business. What is it? In the Fed. You know about the Fed? You know the new head of the Fed? You know what the Fed is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's uh, Janet Yellen is followed Ben Bernanke, who followed Greenspan. I'm sorry, they're all Jewish. Um, Jews make up 0.02% of the world population. 0.02%. But they make up 22% of the people who receive Nobel Prizes. The reason I'm saying that and I'm bragging is because three people won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry this year, and it was announced yesterday. They're all Jewish. That's not business, okay? That's chemistry. That's linear, syllogistic thinking. So it can translate into other areas as well. But that, that's, that's the story, really, if you will, of, of Jewish globalism. It started with diaspora. It started with a need to change economically in order to fit a world where you could no longer um, be a peasant. And it is a result of a change in religious culture that really stressed education and allowed Jews to position themselves in, uh, in trade across uh, religious, cultural, ethnic, and linguistic boundaries. And that's kind of uh, an accident of history. It's an accident, really, of history. I'm going to end now so that if people have any questions about globalization or presumptions about Jewish life. How many people have heard of the so-called Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion? How many, have anybody heard of that? Okay. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. <laughs> right. So that is, a, that's one, that is fallout from the economic necessity of Jews engaging in commerce. Do you know what the protocols are? Can I tell you? Do you want to tell me? Tell us what it is. What's the protocols? 
it yeah. Like, it was propaganda. Yeah. Like a, the Jewish conspiracy. Yeah, it was a it was a um, a propagandistic stick. What is it called when you have a, a cabal? A uh, there's a, another term in English that's slipping my mind. You accuse somebody of something, but you can't. That's a conspiracy. That's right. It's a conspiracy. It is a an accusation that Jews conspired to control the economies of the world or the economy of the world, and that. They really want to destroy the world, and so they uh, um, uh, infiltrate all kinds of places, and um, in doing so, they're sort of the source of all evil in the world. This is part of an old, uh, uh, really an old kind of racist, uh, anti-Semitic uh, viewpoint that uh, didn't start with the protocols, but the protocols became a very important um, uh, means of propagating this kind of uh, racist, anti-Semitic viewpoint. But it is based on, as all, as most, uh, most racism uh, or, or prejudicial attitudes are based on a misunderstanding through observation of a community. Where you see a community and you misunderstand or you don't really understand how the community is functioning and you, uh, you kind of assume the worst and you and that you can be convinced that there's a conspiracy uh, of uh, negativity that's associated with some aspect of that community of people. So that, that is part of the fallout of this reality of Jewish, be, Jewish life and Jewish diaspora and Jews being spread around the world. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to end here and see if they have any questions. We've probably gone more than enough time. Anybody have any questions about this kind of Jewish world of... Uh, do you know how many Jews exist in the world today? <laughs> how many... I, I would like to... someone to venture a guess. I, mean, I already gave you a kind of a small percentage of the world population. But... Um, there are... there are more... Uh, more Jews... more people living in greater Los Angeles than there are Jews in the world. So the greater Los Angeles County, Orange County area, uh, there are just not that many Jews in the world. In all the world, there are less than 14 million Jews. I think. So it's uh, pretty difficult to uh, uh, be in control with 14 million, unless you happen to be satanic. But if you if you're in the you know in the hands of the devil, then I guess you could do anything, and that leads me to one other issue. And I'm sorry, but I am going to say this because it's important to say this. Every every community, every community, whether you come from a part of northeast China, or you come from any area in South America, or you come from the United States and any area in the United States. Every community has a, a, a I don't, it's, I don't, the term is a problematic term, but it has a scapegoat. That is, every community has a prejudicial perspective towards some community within that community, some small portion of that community. It seems to be a part of human nature. In the West, in the West, in the United States and in Europe today, there is a general prejudice against Jews, called anti-Semitism. There is a general prejudice against Muslims, which we now have a new term for called Islamophobia. But both of those, and in America, in the United States, there is a general prejudice against blacks, people of, of African origin in America today. And in all of these cases, this notion of prejudice, and I assume I, we, people have done studies of this in Eastern Europe, and they've done studies of this in China, they've done studies of them in the Middle East, in all communities. They're not, not everybody has prejudice against Jews, Muslims, or blacks, but in every case, those prejudices are so deeply embedded within the culture that everyone picks up on it and learns it and absorbs it and integrates it into their worldview. So that even, for example, the people who are being resented in that culture pick up a certain aspect of that cultural prejudice themselves. 
So in, in America, there's been a lot of writing about um, African-American self-hatred. Self-hatred of African-Americans because it's so much a part of American culture that African-Americans feel prejudice against Africans as well, at some level. How is that done? Because there are stories, folk tales, music, vocabulary, literature, art, and all the other ways in which culture conveys information informally by accident, not necessarily on purpose, continues to further a kind of worldview which is negative against a particular group. Right? And that's something that we don't even necessarily feel in our own traditions. For those of you, I think I see some people who probably come from other parts of the world as well. I bet you also have your own sub-communities within your national context in which you have people who are persecuted or considered second class or not as smart or not as civilized or what have you. And this is an aspect of life which uh, Jews have suffered with for a very, very long time, but don't suffer any more than other people in other areas and other communities who suffer from the same thing. So this is an aspect that one learns, particularly if you live as a minority in another country for a period of time, and you feel what it's like not to get the majority culture, not to understand it and feel it deeply. So I'm going to close with just a, a, a recommendation that I, I, I've learned because I understand Pepperdine is really big on this. It, um, Pepperdine is very good on encouraging students to study abroad. Right? How many people have studied abroad through Pepperdine so far? How many people are planning to study abroad through Pepperdine? How many people have studied in a country in which the native language is not English? Great. How did that feel? Sometimes a little bit uncomfortable, <coughs> right? Didn't get the culture, didn't get the lingo. I highly recommend everyone spending time in another country in which you don't understand fully the language and the culture, it will be help you to learn to see things in a different way, with a different angle, a different approach, and it will probably be better for your learning and education in general as well. So thank you very much for Israel. study. Uh, and then, and they the supported that, but, but the, oh, they were quite the last thing. Most people, they didn't. Israelis. And that was oh, probably the, because uh, Christianity became so successful relatively uh, early okay. on. So when it became a religion of empire, they needed soldiers, and they needed peasants, and they needed everybody How many to keep said? the empire ten. going. Ten. Yeah. Whereas where, when Jews were kind of spread out around the world, they, they, didn't, yeah. they didn't need to be peasants. They didn't yeah, need yeah. to be soldiers. You're welcome. I like it. Okay. Cool. How are you doing? I'm Darren Dorothy. Hi. Nice to meet you, Darren. Good to meet you. Yeah. Darren teaches in the religion division. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, great. Good. What do you teach? I teach um, several things, but mainly church history and world Christianity and world religions. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I taught a class called Abrahamic Faiths. Yeah. Hey, how do you do yeah. it? Yeah, I do, for sure. Yes. So, yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. Yeah. I'm a historian. Yeah. Right, yes, I got your... Uh, and I, I think globally, you know, all the issues that yeah. I look at, I try to look at globally. Yeah. Which is yeah. fun. Because, yeah. you know, Christianity is all over the place these days. So. Right, and it's so you know, in different places. Don't, it'll just make you worry. Just, well, yeah, worry, worry. You know, My <laughs> specialty is Christianity in just, South um, India. Just oh, really? make sure you so, have other yeah. options. That's an old yeah. community, because there's yeah, no guarantee. Yeah. 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 yeah, in fact, you were saying how uh, Judaism, I, I didn't catch the, the date you were referring to, but you said it went as far as Pakistan. What, what were you talking about there? You said Because I, I was wondering if, if it didn't go to India as well. Oh, I, I'm sure it went to India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I mean, I should have probably said India. I was thinking in terms of China. Or I, don't think, I don't know if it went further in oh, okay. the north area. Mm -hmm. But eventually they got onto the Silk Trail yeah. on the Silk Road. So we tried and they were to make all the little Jewish communities all the way all close to Shanghai and to, our from to China very early. Okay. Because they're cooler. Uh, to bring. They, many of them yeah. after the yeah. 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 died out. Yeah. Okay. There was one a famous, a really a famous, <laughs> really interesting <laughs> case where the cross of the missionaries so that's fun you were in China. You'll, you'll fit right in. Nineteenth century, I hope, well, it's funny. and they saw these Chinese people, yes, Chinese, 
I mean, racially, ethnically, linguistically, Chinese, Chinese yeah. local Chinese people doing I mean, strange, like, strange uh, rituals. Or and then they, they came like, and they looked and they went inside and they found out that they were in a synagogue. Huh. And they actually had writings in Hebrew. Okay. And they had lost contact yeah. with the okay. Jewish community the after some house. empire broke yeah, off yeah, all contact. And they remained, yeah. and they intermarried and remained. Yeah, just got really excited. Not really Jewish for a the brochures back. Oh, you already got all the inspiration. You're literally the first applicant yeah, to a long time. submit. So, well, because I kept thinking about it. And I was yeah, like, there's you know little stories of Christians to it. Yeah, I bet. Like, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's one uh, um, really fortunate one about uh, Christians in Japan. With the what? what? Oh, really? Who, oh, tell uh, me. There were yes. some missions yeah. at, at a tolerant yeah. era in Japan. In Tel Aviv? And then, no. uh, and then okay. the, uh, well, these came about with Xavier mm -hmm. and the early Jesuits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're talking like, uh, you know, yeah. 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 So yeah. that. Yeah. Really? No. Yeah. In the service and, uh, industry. But anyway, yeah. so then uh, the, the Jap Japan like, kind of had some governments that were that, that were hard on Christians. No, you I, probably I have heard about some of those persecutions yeah. of Christians. Uh, and they were yeah. some of the yeah. most brutal. Okay. They, yeah. they so that's did what horrible like things with the, okay. with the Christians. But then the okay. French, during the yeah, for sure. The uh, European yeah, escapades. Well, good job but, getting um, it in so well. Okay. Yeah, because I was like, I kept thinking about it. You know, it's been in the back of my head. Yeah. And, and so well, that's not the end of the story. Yeah, it's a bit of the story. Okay. So it's basically just the interviews and, the, and that's it? Like, you don't do letters of recommendation or any transcripts, any of that? Okay, good. Uh, transcripts, yes. Who are these people? Yeah, but unofficial, just copy and paste. Several of them actually practice Is it the pepper one? Just the pepper one. Okay. Because the French brought attention. Nice seeing you again, Drew. Yeah, the hit, you can just type in the, the hidden Christians in yeah. Japan. Okay. There's, yeah, there's there's a growing body of scholarship, but there's like probably six or seven scholars that, that research that. That's very interesting. Yeah, the hidden Christians. Yeah. Well, but, that's, uh, a, that's a phenomenology of religion, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You see that also with um, Muslims yeah. in uh, Spain and Shiites in Sunni sure. Islam. Yeah, which, which could have a connection to Christianity. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's how I've always viewed viewed. I, I don't know that that goes on today, but I've always viewed Shiism as possibly, um, you know, linking itself with, with Christianity, finding a, a cousin in Christianity. And I think certain forms of Shiism were basically uh, Christians living as Muslims in Muslim societies. That's interesting. Do you know if anybody's written, written on that? I, I know that there is stuff on that, yeah. yeah because sure. especially in, um, in what is today Iran, there was a significant non-Orthodox Christian community that lived there in order to be free from the difficulties of living under the Orthodox Byzantines, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there were very large, significant Eastern Christian communities, Nestorian, sure. yeah. and, you know. Yeah, the Assyrians. And yeah. Yeah, others. Yeah. Associated with Antiochian yeah, forms. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Right. So that, yeah, I'm, I'm one, because, and, and when Shiism be, always was a, I mean, you know, Shiism became the dominant religion in Iran because a Shah in the 16th century forced all the Sunnis to become Shiite. Mm -hmm. But uh, but there always was a strong Shi, Shiite community yeah. there, and there was a strong Christian community there, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, and one, I don't think one ever knows uh, these things. I mean, these are these are some of these cultural influences that you, you can't really rigorously find in an archive. That, yeah. Oh, these are right. Christians. Right. <laughs> right. The, the Although with the Baha'is, uh -huh. there's a very high percentage of Jews and Christians in the Baha'i mm -hmm. Yeah, but we became Baha'is. I mean, they lost their Judaism and Christianity yeah. in order yeah. to become Baha'is. In order to become yeah. Baha'i. Let's continue this. Uh, Darius uh, sure. can enjoy us for dinner. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to run so, to the washroom okay. right here, and then we're going to go out this door. Is that right? Yeah, let me actually just... Uh, Are we going to go in one car or close line? Let's okay. actually drive separately because um, okay. cause we're going in that direction. Uh, yeah, and I'm actually going to go to... I have to go on Malibu Canyon to the valley and go somewhere there. Okay, so, okay. I guess, uh, we're not going to be far from here. No, we? not at all. Okay. Just up the line. Yeah, maybe, maybe. May, may not be the recording, but it's.